a pristine waterfall in the Central American nation of Costa Rica. Do such places have value in and of themselves? Do they have an intrinsic value? Do they have a value that we cannot put a dollar sign on? Something that says we should preserve it for its own sake. Such a deeply ecocentric value system is one that's extremely difficult to measure. The idea that living things have equal rights and that all living beings should be preserved for their own sake. Putting the intrinsic value aside, this waterfall is a source of natural capital, for it can be a means of generating hydroelectric power, or it can attract many tourists to the site to experience the natural beauty and to swim in its plunge pool and to view the wildlife supported in the surrounding region. When a natural resource has the potential to continuously generate an income while at the same time being preserved, economists look at this as being a source of natural capital with the potential to continuously generate natural income. But resources of this kind were not viewed in this way 200 years ago. And it is only today that ecotourism has become a source of income for many countries. And this is described as the dynamic nature of resources. At one time, it may have little or no value, but somewhere along the line, within 100, 200 years, something that's seemingly worthless today may suddenly become extremely valuable. An excellent example of this is uranium, a modern-day source of energy, nuclear energy. 100 years ago, this was a worthless resource. Resources have a dynamic nature. Welcome again. Today we explain the concept of resources in terms of natural income. We define the terms renewable, replenishable and non-renewable natural capital. We explain the dynamic nature of the concept of a resource. We discuss the view that the environment can have its own intrinsic value. We explain the concept of sustainability in terms of natural capital and natural income. We discuss the concept of sustainable development and we calculate and explain sustainable yield from given data. When someone deposits 50 pounds into a bank account, we can describe this deposit as a capital investment. If left for a period of one year, this 50 pound deposit yields one pound of interest. And if the depositor were to continue to use one pound per year, then the initial deposit of 50 pounds or this capital stock would continue to sustain him with a yield or an interest of one pound. And once the rate of interest remains the same and his personal rate of consumption remains the same, then the 50 pounds would be able to sustain him for an indefinite period of time. This bamboo that's being used here in Hong Kong for construction scaffolding can be looked at in 
a very similar way to the one pound withdrawal from the bank. If we looked at the bamboo forest as being similar to the 50 pound deposit, the extraction or the yield of the bamboo that's used as the scaffolding would be the equivalent of the one pound of interest. So if this source of natural capital was used in such a manner that the yield or the amount of new bamboo that was generated per unit of time, like one year, only that amount was consumed in construction scaffolding, then such a yield or a use of this natural capital would be sustainable. Sustainable yield, therefore, can be seen as the total biomass or energy at time t plus 1, t plus 1 being the year 2015, where t is the year 2014, so the total biomass at time t plus 1 minus the current biomass would give you the sustainable yield or the amount of bamboo that can be used in construction scaffolding. Putting some numbers into that equation, we can see that if the total biomass in tons per hectare in 2015 equals 152, and the total biomass in 2014 equals 147.3, then it means that this particular forest has the potential to yield 4.7 tons per hectare of construction scaffolding. And in this way, the sustainable yield is very similar to the interest that we draw from a deposit. Another kind of sustainable yield can apply to animal populations that are harvested for food or for recreational hunting, where the sustainable yield equals the annual growth of the population and adds on to that any migrations or new recruitments of members of the population and takes away from that the death rate and the emigration or the individuals that leave the population. This kind of measure may apply to a deer population that's being used in a sustainable manner where the annual growth might be 500 new deer with no recruitment and the annual death might be 80. So in this case, the sustainable yield would be 420, meaning that it would allow hunters to take 420 animals per year. Natural capital is a term used by economists for natural resources that, if appropriately managed, can produce a natural income. Three kinds of natural capital are recognized. Non-renewable, renewable, and replenishable. Non-renewable natural capital refers to the resources that cannot be renewed, like fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas. Replenishable natural capital refers to non-living resources that depend on energy of the sun for their replenishment, like the ozone layer which can be replenished and provide a shield against harmful ultraviolet rays. But the best example of replenishable natural capital is water. And then, of course, there is the bamboo forest, the renewable natural capital, natural resources that can provide us with a sustainable yield or harvest. A most notorious example of unsustainable use of forest 
is here on Easter Island in the Pacific Ocean. Easter Island once provided a thriving population with timber and forest resources. But because the rate of consumption exceeded the natural production, then the 50 pound capital deposit, as it were, was over time depleted by the people of Easter Island. And eventually there was no 50 pound deposit in the bank anymore to generate the natural income. This translated into the complete deforestation of Easter Island. The Kaiter National Park in Guyana. This pristine waterfall presents a tremendous source of wealth for this developing South American nation, for it can be a source of hydroelectricity. Yet today, the resource seems to have a much greater value, one that comes from the dynamic nature of resources and the booming ecotourism trade. The Kaiter waterfall is part of the national park and the Guyana government has implemented a plan that allows the park to generate a continuous flow of income to meet its operational costs and would ensure sustainability of the park's future. But they also plan to support community development and to improve participation in park management as a means of promoting effective management of the national park. This is an excellent example of sustainable development where the natural resource of the waterfall and its beauty is preserved for future generations. Yet at the same time, the local community is allowed to develop by participation in the park. And sustainable development is a kind of development that does not sacrifice environmental protection, but it seeks a balance. It is a development to meet the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Another way to look at sustainable development is to consider the ecological footprint of a society or that area of land and water required to support the population at the standard of living that it desires. And if this ecological footprint, as was the case in Easter Island, exceeds the carrying capacity of the environment, then this can lead to an unsustainable situation where the amount of resources that are needed exceeds the capacity of the environment. And in this sense, the tragedy of Easter Island is really a microcosm of the current dilemma faced by planet Earth.